Finally, we'll have a comment from Judith Miller, Associate Professor of History at Emory University. Uh, Professor Miller has recently co-edited Republics at War, 1776 to 1840, Revolutions, Conflicts, and Geopolitics in Europe and the Atlantic World with Pierre Serna and Antonino De Francesco. Uh, it's from Paul Grave uh, in 2013. And she's completing her book manuscript, The Political Self of the French Revolution, 1750 to 1804. Hey, thank you very much. I'm going to stay right here because I've got a rebellious laptop that is not showing me the respect and honor that I deserve. <laughs> um, and I also have to say, I am so relieved that the music that I kept hearing is not a product of my imagination <laughs> on day two, the end of day two of a conference. So, okay. So, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this, this panel. Um, I will say, as we teeter on the on our own 21st century ledge and contemplate regime changes and the role of emotion in those changes, changes anger, despair, solidarity, alarm, reassurance, um, and conspiracy theories. We are fortunate to have a set of papers on, in the three panels on emotions and regime change that allow us to place these matters in historical context and perhaps even to ignore whatever news has surfaced today while we contemplate writings from even more tumultuous eras. The papers show us in particular how emotions um, create emotional communities. Or, yes, in Professor Kuhn's paper, the efforts to deploy an emotional vocabulary of deference, hierarchy, and respect, for instance, went awry, most notably during the Orme, when more egalitarian language and values rebuffed the attempts to bring the rebels to order. Professor Kuhns deftly showed us that conflicting languages and understandings of emotions opened up um, um, new understandings of the depth of the conflict in the princely Fronde and the turmoil of Bordeaux in the middle of the 17th century. The momentary failure of a language of respect, esteem, and protection nearly brought regime change of an unexpected sort, or at least for um, the Prince de Fronde, to Bordeaux. Professor Kuhn's analysis re revealed deeper fissures in what we already knew was a fractured society. Professor Thompson moves us to a more than a century later to reveal how fear and then fraternity operated to generate and reinforce community in the midst of the summer of 1789. She argued that fear became politically transform transformative and even necessary to the creation of a unified community. Parisians were able to normalize fear and to pair it with the hope of fraternity, thus creating a revolutionary emo emotional community in ways that helped them survive the tumult of the revolution and terror. Last, Professor Walton looked at the memories of four, or the memoirs of four women who lived in the time of, Napoleon, of the Napoleonic Empire and Restoration. She revealed an emerging and more consciously gendered reaction to the era in the writings of these women. They saw their feelings as distinctive and better, even more honorable in a society that valued honor than those of the men who surrounded them. They felt greater guilt, they suffered more, and their emotional lives followed a chronology that was not in harmony with the political world of the men around them. I want to make two related points here in my comments, both methodological. First, I want to look at the matter of vocabulary in these papers, and second, I want to discuss issues of narrative as they appear in the text these papers treat. Throughout these papers, we hear key words repeated, and I will leave them in French here for the moment. In particular, sentiment and émotion, and especially in Professor Walton's paper, mémoire. Mm -hmm. These words, indeed, the entire vocabulary of feelings was utterly transformed in the nearly two centuries that these papers cover. That meant the ways in which emotions could be deployed, whether for political goals or for self-interrogation, were utterly transformed also. And I will say that one of the, also, there's a further methodological problem that I think we all know. Not only do these words shift meaning over centuries, there are no easy, translations to go into English. So I hope we'll just all agree there's going to be slippage and some problems with what I'm trying to articulate here. 
So I would say, as Professor Coons develops his project, I would urge him to go further still in his attention to the discourse of feeling. And fortunately, there is a good body of scholarship, whether from literature, philosophy, or the history of science to draw upon. Just taking here the word sentiment, but we could do the same thing with émotion, mémoire, imagination, all those words of feeling and the psyche. The word sentiment in 17th century usage is, seems to be, or at least this is my impression, an impression being yet another one of those words that shifts all over the place, seem to be closer to what one would call an opi opinion or a judgment. The king might wish his sentiments on the law to be known. Um, Pierre Richelet's 1680 Dictionnaire, Dictionnaire Francais gives a series of such examples. Sentiments are avis, opinions, or pensées, thoughts on the subject. They could also be linked to the senses. If one sat, behind a f sat beside a fire, one had a sentiment of heat. The emotional terms deployed in Kuhn's paper tend toward, and here, you can tell me if I'm heading in the right direction, the conventional and the normative, to stable, even codified values that challenge no hierarchy or received wisdom. Although John McCormick's paper this morning, another terrific paper in these, this group, on neo-stoicism and tears in the depictions of Maria de Medici, showed how the construction of new discourses in fraught political circumstances could be rife with conflict. So perhaps it's not all as stable as I'm making it out. In many ways, the emotions used in Kuhn's paper seem to me to refer to a set of external values. Here are the, it's external values. To a repertoire that was adopted and performed publicly, even if claimed to be felt by the individual. These emotions come from outside. They are the benchmarks of laudable behavior. Richelet, our dictionary writer, however, noted that several new ways of speaking were likening sentiment to, or sentiment to, affection, such as the esteem one has for someone, or a feeling of honor, or even to the tenderness one has for one's children. These were his new usages in 1680. Here we see an opening that will lead to the sentimental world of Enlightenment novels, theater, painting, and political rhetoric. For just over the horizon of Kuhn's historical actors were a whole range of new inquiries into the nature of the self, the source of sentiments, and the body as a site of emotions. Literary theorists developed a term for this deepening of the self, interiority, and this is a term that goes back to the 70s and 80s. The word sentiment here drew even more powerfully on the idea of the senses. Uh, Lockean and then mid-century materialism even created people as machines registering the world that surrounded them through vision, sound, and touch. Their bodies, too, often speak more loudly than their words. The trembling hand of a young woman seen across the room tells a lover all he needs to know about her sentiment for him. Moreover, these somatic feelings were contagious, and one really sees this in Victoria's paper. Sympathy courses through a group of people creating an emotional community in a way that I, they, I don't believe they do in the 17th century. Finally, in Dr. Walton's paper, we see a further deepening of the emotional world through the gendered constitution of identity and an identity generated through the construction of memory. Uh, if we would also do another genealogy of memory, it is not surprising that memory would become a political and personal problem in the wake of the revolution. But also for early psychiatrists like Pinel, for physicians, legislators, and social commentators, the question of memory, of imagination, of the workings of the mind were central to the nascent sciences and social sciences. Sentiment in each of these areas meant quite different things and worked in very different ways. They were located in different parts of the body. They were transmitted in, in different ways. And um, they, uh, to craft behavioral, behavioral norms. In the late 18th century and early 19th century, sentiment were far more constitutive of individual identity and a distinctive personality than they were, I believe, in the 17th century. This brings me to a last short comment on the role of narrative in each of these papers. For these texts, used it, for the text used in these papers demonstrate an engagement with narrative genre of their era. 
by narrative, I mean the ways in which elements of a story are assembled and how that structure in turn made the work legible and persuasive for the reader of the period. As but one example, we can take the requête of the Princesse de Condé, with which Dr. Coons opened his paper. I had not read this before. It is terrific. It is an adventure narrative that bears comparison with other such accounts of the era. They are, these accounts are gripping tales of danger, heroic deeds, narrow escapes, and betrayals and confusions. Uh, confusion. The princess's thriller tears along breathlessly, long, long sentences broken with commas, retelling her flight and the terrible sights she has witnessed. It is a virtuosa performance worthy of the early novels of, the, of those decades. By the late 18th century, literary forms followed a somewhat more literary or a linear path in creating an individual or the experiences of a committee, uh, of community. Yet what is striking about those tales is how rapidly, how fluidly emotions fluctuated. Characters, and those from Rousseau come to mind, vacillate endlessly, which drew the reader in more closely. Each moment of emotional stasis is undone in the next one. In fact, one conjures the other, even requires it, as characters are propelled along their emotion-charged course. So I think it is absolutely logical that fear is followed by reconciliation, will be followed by fear, will be followed by... That's what the novel of the period is. Finally, Dr. Walton's memoirists are clearly drawing on romantic novels and poetry, I think, with their deepened interiority their preoccupation with faulty memories and with the woefully adequate willpower. And here we can also think of Constance Adolphe, of course. But I was really taken with the slippage that shows up in the opening Remusa. To remember something is immediately to begin re-experiencing it. And that slippage is all throughout these memoirs. This is a different concept of how memory functions. So I'm perhaps showing, talking about my own preoccupations with the self, the political self. But I found these papers very engaging. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with them. Thank you. Respond if they'd like to the um, I think I have questions to and comments. Questions right? or respond? Or? Maybe questions? Yeah. Should we turn to the audience for questions? Okay. Yes. We've got time for one or two. I haven't read at all. There should be a microphone. Yes. It's real treat to hear three wonderful papers on the history of emotions, so thank you. Um, I have a methodological question, which is about whether or not doing the history of emotion, particularly um, with regards to such famous and well-studied events, it makes you rethink periodization and stories of continuity and change over time. Um, so that's for the whole panel and a big question. So yeah, curious to hear what you think of that. Um, I think it, it, in my own thinking, and it's extremely preliminary yet, um, it troubles the, it, not necessarily the periodization, but I think the sense of cutoff and breakage between periods that we, at, at least in a textbook sense, presume. Um, part of my larger project, and of course there's no room for this in a conference paper, um, is to show the ways in which these kinds of emotional vocabularies and approaches were in fact appropriated by the monarchy um, in ways that I think helped to you know, personalize the king and institutionalize the monarchy in, in you know, uh, Versailles-oriented types of ways. Um, so in that way, I think that the um, the sort of run-up to period period changes or epochal shifts um, is something that. It, I think it requires us to attend more to the um, to the ways in which these things were long brewing and sort of under the surface um, fermentations. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, absolutely, it's made me rethink um, the question of periodization. I think one of the things I, I tried to show, and it's been really interesting for me, is the fact that there are these um, kind of older 
you know, pre-1789, they don't have to be that much older, but, you know, 18th century ways of thinking about and experiencing the world that are brought into the revolution. And then, as with the days surrounding the storming of the Bastille, the, you know, they're used to think about what's happening, but the event itself, these, the series of events also changes kind of the resonance and the meanings attached to those older ways of thinking and experiencing. So it's like co continuity and change are there at the same time, which is one thing I find really fascinating. Yeah, I was at a complete loss trying to figure out <laughs> periodization because, you know, I was thinking, okay, so how do I, how do I understand? And, you know, when, when Judy was talking about the words, I, I quoted in the footnote Gerondeau's thing because she uses sentiment and sensibility she, and, and, and her language. And I'm saying, okay, now where is this coming from? Is she old regime? Is she new romantic sensibility? Is she all of the above? You know, and, and was this um, developed because of all these traumatic experiences? And so, um, it's, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how to reframe it. It has disturbed my understanding of periodization, and I don't know what to put in its place. <laughs> I'll just throw in, I've been doing so much reading in history of science, history of medicine, and there's also literary, uh, the scholarship on literature, that it sort of has kind of uh, messed up any of my sense of revolutionary chronology. And in fact, I've been going back and forth, do I need a thematic treatment of this, or do I need a chronological? And I think I've finally come back to chronological, because for me, there is something that does happen after the fall of Robespierre. Pierre. And the heart of my book is that directory into the consulate mm. moment. And I think that for me is where the really interesting stuff on the self is. Whereas we've had so much on late old regime, enlightenment, sens sensibilité, sentimental. I'm, there's interesting stuff beyond 1794. So I'm back to saying, oh, Thermidor, it matters. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm Christine Haynes from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Uh, I also really enjoyed the panel. Thank you all very much. Uh, I just have two quick follow-up questions for Victoria and Whitney. Um, for Victoria, I was found your argument about 1789 to be very compelling, um, and I especially like the um, what you mentioned about the physicality of emotion uh, during the July days in 1789. Um, but I'm wondering, thinking about chronology, um, does that not fall apart by the time you get to the terror. Um, I don't see people, you know, uh, <laughs> transforming fear into solidarity and embracing each other in the same way that um, you're describing in 1789. So that's a question for you. And then Whitney, just following up on what Judith had to say a little bit, how does the genre of the memoir um, affect emotion of these women? Um, does it intensify their emotion um, or or does the distance of reflection um, actually d decrease or change the emotion that they, you know, probably felt or the way they would have articulated it at the time? Mm -hmm. you go first. Okay, so um, <laughs> that's a great question, and I, I can't, I don't, I haven't done enough research to say definitively that I, I believe something, but or or the other, but. A couple of things that I did do that um, lead me to think that this dynamic of the fear fraternity pairing was still present on the one hand and then to think that it was gone on the other hand. Um, so the first, th what made me think that it's still present is I start, I look, was looking at descriptions of the Festival of the Federation. It's really clear in 1790 that there's a, a attempt to kind of relive and replay these emotions in 1790. So then I was looking at later accounts of the, of later festivals and also later accounts of the festival of 1790. And in later accounts of the festival of the Federation, there there is also, there is always a description that is, um, we feared something terrible was gonna happen, but then it didn't. And we, you know, we just saw everyone come together in a sense of brotherhood. 
good. And that was, and that was also used to describe uh, fest the festival in 1792. So that was not a systematic analysis. I, didn't, haven't, I haven't done that yet, but kind of impressionistically, it made me think, okay, maybe this is, you know, rhetoric that, that, that hangs around. Um, and the other thing was, of course, as, as I was working on this, I was immediately thinking about virtue and terror in, in Robespierre's speech. And so I went back and read that again. And looking at that made me think that, that that link between fear and fraternity did break down, even though in some ways it, it seemed to me at first when I was just thinking about, oh, is he linking these things? It seems so clearly in his speech that he's talking about making others fear fearful who are outside our community, that it was a different dynamic of that pairing. So there's a, there's a lot more to think about there. It's a really good question. Thank you. Well, talk about a good question. You just nailed what my whole issue was trying to write this paper. Because um, I think it, it varied. Um, I think with Ray Musa, it really intensified those emotions. I mean, she's, uh, uh, I found her account, you know, really, really very, very gripping and very, and she's not the only one who does this. It also, the, reflecting upon these emotions, uh, and the memo memoir as memory as well as memoir. Um, some of these writers are quite, they're, they're all over the place. You know, they're chronologically confused. And Laura, uh, Laura Junot actually comes out and says, look, I'm just writing it the way it comes to my head, so it's gonna be confused. And she's very upfront about this, and she's just all over the place, you know. She's starting one story, and then she'll go off on a tangent, and then she'll come back a few pages later. Okay, as I was saying, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and then, but then the problem, I think, for a lot of the published memoirs, um, for some of them at least in Zanon, and you know, I didn't have time to read all 450, so um, is that many of them were, were, were more deliberately crafting a history rather than an autobiography. And, and he, I, he's very helpful in, in, in clarifying that. And again, why, the reason I wound up with so much from Chastanet and Ray Musa, I think is because they did not anticipate publication in their lifetime. And I think they felt freer to, to display these emotions than others. I mean, Laura you know, she did, she did express emotions, but she also had a real agenda, you know? And also, she wanted to make money. I mean, um, so it's a, it's highly variable, and and I need to read more, if not all 450, but at least more of them to to answer that question. But it's it's a huge issue. Thank you all very much for coming, and let's all thank our panelists. Oh, thanks for coming. In.